Good morning. My name is Sylvia Johannes. Um, please open your Bibles to Romans 13, verse 8 through 10. It is on page 1763 in the Blue Bibles. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbors as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is fulfillment of the law. Well, good morning. Good to be here together today, whether you're on site or perhaps watching online this morning. Glad to have you join us that way. If you're here last week, you know that Pastor Eric shared a sermon uh, about how Christ followers should relate to the government. And the end of the text that he preached on ended at Romans 13, 7. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. The Apostle Paul then carries forward this idea of paying what we owe in verse 8. Let no debt remain outstanding. So to be clear, this verse is not saying that it is wrong for Christians to take on debt. What it's saying is that Christians should be the kind of people who pay off their debts, who in a timely manner pay the things that they owe. And that's an important part of our Christian witness. That being said, though, this morning's passage really isn't about financial debt. It's really about our love debt. That's where Paul is going. He's transitioning from this idea of a financial debt to a love debt. So in verse 8, he goes on, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Now, at first glance, we, we hear this phrase, one another, and we might immediately be inclined to think, okay, this is talking about loving other Christians. Let us love one another. But if you look at how verse 8 broadens out toward the end of it, it simply says, whoever loves others. And then verse 9 goes on to remind us of this familiar command, love your neighbor as yourself. Which, of course, brings the parable of the Good Samaritan to mind. Jesus also talked about loving our neighbors. And when he talked about that, he was pretty clear that we shouldn't try to limit or narrow down the list of who we should love. In fact, I found a great note in my footnotes in my study Bible this week. It says, the neighbor whom we must love is anyone the Lord puts in our path. So loving our neighbors means loving anyone the Lord puts in our path. It's a good way to say it, good way to summarize what we're talking about here today. Today's verses have a broad application to all peoples, both believers and non-believers. We owe the people around us a love debt. And it's a debt that's always going to remain outstanding. We can't pay it off. We can't pay ahead and, and be caught up on that payment. There's always going to be this outstanding debt of love. Which means that there isn't anyone to whom a Christian can say, I don't owe you a thing. Because the fact is, we do owe. We owe everyone. Every person on the planet, we owe them something love. As deeply devoted followers of Jesus, God has placed us in a position of indebtedness, and not just indebtedness to one another as fellow believers, but indebtedness to everyone on the planet, all of our fellow human beings. And so if we want to be like our Heavenly Father, then we will love this lost world of sinners. One of the distinguishing marks of a Christ follower is that we will be loving our neighbors as ourselves. Same gospel that rescued us while we were still spiritually lost, it calls us to live out a life of love, a love that treats those who are spiritually lost far better than they deserve to be treated. 
because we were treated far better than we deserved to be treated. This is God's good, pleasing, perfect will. The gospel is a gospel for everyday living, and it is a gospel for everyday loving. I've recently started taking an evangelism class with some other pastors, and in this class, one of the things we've been learning about is an acronym by Rick Richardson. The acronym is FRANCES. It stands for Friends, Relatives, Acquaintances, Neighbors, Colleagues, Enemies, and Strangers. And the idea of this acronym is to get us thinking about who our neighbors are, who God has called us to love, who God has called us to share the gospel with. So loving our neighbor means loving our Francis, these different people, these different ways of understanding the people in our world. Now, if you're following along in the bulletin insert today, you'll notice that after you fill in the blanks for the the Francis, then there's another blank to the right of that equal sign. I want to encourage you to think about a particular name or set of initials that you could maybe write next to that to identify a relationship in your life. In other words, write the name or the initials of a spiritually lost friend that God is calling you to love. Think of a spiritually lost relative or an acquaintance or an actual neighbor who lives near your house and they may not necessarily go to church very much, but someone you could pray for. Pray for their spiritual well-being. Pray that you will love them well as their neighbor. Same thing with your non-Christian colleagues from work or from school or with an enemy or a stranger. How might God be specifically calling you to love that particular person as your neighbor, as yourself? I don't know how many of you watched the Super Bowl last week, but once again the game featured some commercials that got people talking. Some of those commercials were by a group called He Gets Us. These commercials have stirred up quite a bit of conversation, even some controversy among Christians and non-Christians. One of the commercials was a series of images that were showing Christians washing their neighbor's feet. The He Gets Us website explains, honestly, images of people washing each other's feet look a little strange and disconcerting because it's not part of our modern-day customs. But there's also something beautiful and profound in each image. Our hope is that our latest commercials will stimulate both societal discussion and individual self-reflection about who is my neighbor and how each can love our neighbor even as we have differences and serve one another with more kindness and respect. Now, regardless of whether or not you're a fan of these commercials, we should at least appreciate the attempt that is being made here to call us to self-reflection, to really think about who is my neighbor and how do I love them well? As someone who's striving to become a deeply devoted follower of Jesus, how can I obey Jesus' command to love my neighbor as myself? Practically, who is that and how do I do it? Loving our neighbor also means fulfilling the law's intention for holiness, but also for love. Romans 13.8 ends by declaring, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. And verse 10 repeats it once again. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, we know that humanly speaking, we are not able of our own volition, of our own merit to fulfill the righteous requirements of God's law. We studied that chapter after chapter early on in Romans. It was very clear. The only one who can meet the law's righteous requirements is Jesus by his perfect sacrifice on the cross. That is the only thing that meets the requirements, the perfect righteous requirements of the law. But what verses 8 and 10 are pointing out here is God's ongoing work in the life of believers. Once God's Spirit indwells a believer, 
He enables us to live a righteous and a holy life. But it's interesting to note here, if you think about it, these verses don't even mention holiness. They mention love. You see, we have a tendency of thinking that fulfilling the law is all about obeying God's commands by saying no to sin and being personally holy. And that is certainly part of it. Absolutely, holiness is a big deal. But today's verses have us think about another aspect of the law and fulfilling the law. Today's verses are making us consider that loving our neighbors well fulfills the law. It's worth thinking about. Verse 9 goes on, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's a pretty important command. If all the rest can be summed up in this one thing, here in verse 9, Paul shows that there are a number of other particular commands that he could list. He, it's not like he listed them comprehensively by any means. But rather than trying to list all of them, he simply says, whatever other command there may be. Paul boils it down for us by stating it succinctly. They're summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus also highlighted this very thing. He was asked, which, of the, which is the greatest commandment in the law? His reply was to love God and love people. Specifically, Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he went on to say, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus himself declared, there is no commandment greater than than these. And both of these commands focused on love. All of this reveals just how powerful this principle of Christian love truly is. As we've discussed in a previous sermon, something doesn't have to be complicated or flashy in order to be powerful and life-changing. This simple idea of genuine Christian love a deep and consistent, sincere love for one's neighbor is a profound work of God in this world. Loving our neighbors as ourselves can also be an extremely practical way of deciding what to do when we can't necessarily find a Bible verse to give us specific direction for a particular situation that we're in. In other words, loving our neighbor as ourselves is an extremely valuable guiding principle. It's an incredibly helpful litmus test for our day-to-day -day decisions in the faith. What ought I to do here in this conversation, in this relationship, in, in this circumstance? And we apply this Christian love to the situation. As followers of Jesus, we can simply call on the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and discernment. How can I love well in this situation? Now, that being said, Paul isn't saying here in verse 9 that Christ followers should therefore throw away all of God's laws. As though we no longer need any of the other commands because we have this one and it sums them all up so you can toss all the rest of them out. Ignore them. Don't need them anymore. That's not what Paul's suggesting. He has been clear in Romans that God's law is holy and righteous and good. And Jesus made it clear to his followers when he was speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, he told his followers to be careful to guard against setting aside the commandments or teaching others to do the same. The fact is, given our ongoing struggle and temptation with sin, it's essential for us to have a particular list of commandments because they give us a concrete example of exactly what God is expecting so they're still important and quite helpful because it's all too easy for us as humans to justify our sin, 
to justify our adulterous behavior or murder or stealing or coveting or any number of other things that God has commanded us not to do. There's a Bible scholar named John Stott, and he says it well. There are some who insist that now nothing is prescribed except love and that law is no longer needed. Love has its own built-in moral compass which discerns intuitively what a true respect for persons will demand in each situation. But this expresses a naive confidence in love's infallibility. The truth is that love cannot manage on its own without an objective moral standard. That is why Paul wrote that love is the fulfillment of the law. For love and law need each other. Love needs law for its direction, while law needs love for its inspiration. I think that's well put. See, if we're not careful, we can fall into the modern-day tendency to justify our sins in the name of love. It just seemed like the loving thing. We develop a prideful overconfidence in our own ability to discern God's will on our own, apart from His Word, apart from the direction of His commands. And so while there's certainly a place for us as Christians to follow the way of love and to be a loving people and to let God, love guide us, we need to be careful that we don't walk into some, uh, some kind of a Disney princess theology. Just follow your heart. This kind of seemingly harmless approach can lead us into all kinds of sinful behavior. For example, a Christian spouse can end up justifying their adulterous affair by simply declaring, well, we're just following our hearts. We're just following the way of love. How can it possibly be wrong if two people genuinely, truly love each other? Just to be clear, this is an example of abusing this Christian principle of letting love be our guide. And it's a clear illustration of why we need to keep objective moral standards in mind. Like God's command, thou shalt not commit adultery. So God's commands provide us with good boundaries for how we define holiness. But the intention of God's law isn't just to make us holy. It's also to make us loving. It's only when we love our neighbor as ourselves that God's law is ultimately fulfilled. I need to get a drink of water. I'll be right back. Sorry about that. I'm guessing it got moved for the youth conference. So, <clears throat> Loving our neighbors also means gaining a reputation for love rather than harm. Romans 13.10 concludes today's passage, Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. It's interesting to note here that this word harm in verse 10 is the same Greek word that's translated evil back at the end of Romans 12 and in verse 21. Romans 12, 12, 21 taught us, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So harm and evil are within the same range of meaning for this same Greek word. Therefore, loving our neighbors as ourselves not only means that we'll do them no harm, but it's also another way that we can overcome evil with good. We overcome evil things like adultery and murder and stealing and coveting by loving our neighbors as ourselves and doing them no harm. Verse 9 says, And whatever other command there may be, even though it seems like this should be, you know, go without saying, verse 10 makes it clear that a distinguishing mark of a follower of Jesus should be that we love our neighbors rather than doing them harm in any way. Timothy Keller points out that the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah is the great biblical example of overcoming evil with good as he calls the Jewish exiles in Babylon to overcome evil 
by seeking the prosperity of their city. Keller writes, the Israelites are to become involved with the city and seek its peace and prosperity. They are not to compromise with pagan values, but they are to be gloriously positive toward the city, to seek the peace, the shalom of the city, to pursue its overall harmony and prosperity, and to pray to the Lord for it. So Jeremiah is telling believers to overcome evil with good by bringing their love and faith to bear on the public good of the city in which they live. This is the setting for Paul's direction in Romans 13, 8 through 10. I want to close today with a word of encouragement about loving our neighbors. Many of you who are part of Ephri Bemidji are loving your neighbors so well. You're doing such a great job. And as your pastor, I want to commend you for that because it's wonderful. It's a beautiful, powerful work of God that is being done. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're perfect, that any one of us is perfect, or that we don't miss it once in a while. There's certainly room for growth and improvement. But overall, my observation is that a good number of the people from our church are knocking it out of the park, loving our neighbors as ourselves. You guys are crushing it, and I want you to know that. It's the way to be. One of the reasons I wanted to end today with that is that Many times as Christians, we don't get much encouragement in the media. When we read the news, when we look online, when we listen to a news report, a lot of it is pretty discouraging toward Christians, as though there's really not a whole lot of good that Christians do anymore. And that's unfortunate. Recently, I began reading a book titled, Christians Are Hate-Filled Hypocrites and Other Lies You've Been Told written by a professor of sociology, Dr. Bradley Wright. And in his book, Dr. Bradley shatters many of the negative myths about Christians that have been promoted in the media for decades. And just to be clear, they've been promoted by secular and Christian news outlets. In other words, sometimes we pick on ourselves more than anybody else does. Let me share just one example. It's an example that is from about 20 years ago, but it illustrates well what we're getting at. And this example comes out of uh, Dr. Wright's book. About 20 years ago, Barna conducted a survey of 270 non-Christians. The goal was to measure their impression of various groups within society, including non-Christians' impressions of evangelicals. Based on the data collected in this particular study, evangelicals were ranked pretty low by these non-Christians. In fact, the only group who scored lower than evangelicals were prostitutes. Do any of you remember this study? Unfortunately, this kind of statistical data is very catchy. It catches like wildfire. It's sells like hotcakes to the public. And if you're trying to sell your media, sometimes you publish these things, whether they're accurate or not. We humans have this insatiable appetite for this kind of disturbing news. And not only non-Christians, but Christians too. We eat this stuff up. So it's not surprising that several groups picked up on this survey and they ran with it and they squeezed it for all it was worth, sold as much press as they possibly could. The Atlantic Magazine titled this study, Evangelicals and Prostitutes. They wrote, non-Christians, it turns out, have a low regard for evangelical Christians whom they view less favorably than all the above-mentioned groups except one, prostitutes. One author summarized Barna's study in a similar way, although they didn't even cite the actual study. 
Shortly after that, a Christian organization picked up that statistic from that author and then featured it on their own website as evidence that Christianity is losing its influence in America. And I bet many of us have heard that very message recently if we surf the net and listen to the news and read anything online. It's becoming a growing message. Christianity is losing its influence in America. Well, after that, several bloggers then picked it up from there and summarized it this way. Only prostitutes rank lower than evangelicals in terms of respect in the mind of the public. Now, if you're watching carefully, now it's gone from non-Christians to the entire society feels this way. And I could go on, but it only gets worse from there. And by now, I think you probably get the point. With each retelling, the data continues to get less and less accurate and more and more dire. And that sells newspapers and magazines and gets hits on websites. It's kind of like the old game of telephone where each person whispers something in the person's ear next to them. Now, it's understandable how hearing a report like this could give non-Christians and Christians alike a negative impression of Christians. You could see how that could happen. Here's the thing, though. If you probe into this data and look at it with critical thinking skills, it was greatly misconstrued, terribly misrepresented, and fell miserably short on fact-checking. Friends, it's vital that we check our sources, that we know what's really being said, what's really being measured, that we check our facts. I preached on this a few years ago in a sermon series in Proverbs. Sources matter. So if we take a closer look at the original Barna study, we'll find that the conclusions that people took away from it were woefully misguided. For example, it might interest you to know that in this study, these 270 non-Christians rated ministers and born-again Christians very highly. Same survey. Ten of the groups above the prostitutes and, and above the evangelicals, way up at the top of the list, second place and third place as highly respected by society, by these non-Christians, were ministers and born-again Christians, near the top of the list. Well, how could that be? How could evangelicals be so low and born-again Christians be so high? It seems clear that there may have been some confusion among the respondents about what an evangelical even is. After all, in the minds of many of us, how much distinction would there really be between a born-again Christian and an evangelical? I think an argument could be made that they're fairly synonymous. So apparently these non-Christian respondents were in fact confused as to what an evangelical even is. And perhaps they confused an evangelical with an evangelist who came to their door or something like that. It might also explain why on this statistical data, twice as many respondents marked a column don't know when they were rating evangelicals. Compared to all the other 10, twice as many went to that option of don't know when they were rating evangelicals. I don't mean to bog down in statistics, just to get us thinking carefully. Whether this all be the right way to think about it or not, here's the point. Don't believe everything you hear in the media about how much people dislike Christians. Don't buy into it right away and just assume, well, it must be true. The fact is you're doing great. I hear compliments all the time. I hear people all the time thankful for, appreciative of the Christians in our community, people from our church and other churches and other Christian ministries. There's a good reputation for people who follow Jesus because we're out there loving our community and serving people. And that's what we ought to be doing. It brings glory to God. 
People appreciate how church people are serving in places like the food shelf and Ruby's pantry and Meals on Wheels and on and on. People appreciate how followers of Jesus are so generous and hardworking and how they're making vital resources available in our community, like through the local Women's Pregnancy Center. People appreciate how Christians are out in the community as highly esteemed realtors and mechanics and doctors and bus drivers and veterinarians and school teachers and so much more. I often have people say how much they appreciate the believers who are in these fields serving in our community. So keep it up. Don't let the negative press get you down or discourage you or confuse you about the goodness of what you're doing. You're doing great. Keep loving your neighbor as yourself. God is using it. God is at work in and through you. And you are fulfilling the law of love. God's law is making a huge difference. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you are a God of love and that you are a God who teaches us to love. Help us, Lord, to love our neighbors well. Even the cranky ones, even the ones that are difficult to be with, even those who may be our enemies, even those who've maybe hurt us or betrayed us or who speak poorly of us. Lord, help us to persevere in kindness, to love our neighbors the way you would have us love them. And we pray, Lord God, that as we do this and we fulfill your good and holy commandment, Lord, that your reputation would be lifted high, that many would be drawn to the good news of the gospel. We ask this now together in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen.